All right. Have your you screen. can at least see what I've got set up so far, correct? Yes, I see. Roosevelt takes steps. Yes. And um, unfortunately, from the standpoint of this share, I have to do it according to a different kind of matrix. So I'm going to show it this way. Is everyone at least seeing something? Yep. Yes. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> so this particular, and you don't have to see my face in this thing, but as long as you can see the screen and follow what I'm doing, that will be just fine. The whole function of this set of lectures is to start to move into what I would call a different kind of situation for World War II. And just to recap very briefly what we talked about in the previous set of lectures from 1941 into 1942. And as I concluded that set of lectures, there's a new situation developing. And that is that the United States is becoming dramatically engaged. As I use the example in the past, my own particular definition of World War II doesn't begin September 1st, 1939. It begins when Germany declares war on the United States on December 11th. Nonetheless, there were enormous preparations underway that had a great deal to do with how the United States became engaged and the connection between our engagement and the strategic goals that had been laid out even before we became involved. I mentioned this in part because one of the great dynamics that we deal with even now, that is right now, is how our country and our leaders first, I'll use the word propagandize us about what's going on. And I'm not saying that in a particularly negative sense. Uh, it's how certain governments reveal information to their population to get them ready for what they are leaders in their analysis see as coming down the pike and how we as a nation have to prepare for that. As I've talked about before, and I'll occasionally glance at my text as I uh, talk through this lecture, the issues that the United States was beginning to confront had been dramatically placed in front of us. And as we move into this first section, which is going to be on the Battle of the Atlantic, this is something that started well before the United States became involved. Now, I'm going to use a rather peculiar slide here. And you'll see that what this says as text is tracking of six different wolf packs in Voyager's National Park. And you'll see how these different packs engage with each other, but they define their borders. One of the interesting elements is that in human conflict, certainly back in the day, if you want to go back even to our nomadic period, if you want to go back into our so-called pre-history, that is pre-written history, there was a tendency for any group, any clan, to carve out its territories in which it had sufficient resources to survive. And there were very few forays into another area because each of these areas would tend to be defined and protected by the pack in that case of what we're seeing here, or in even the case of our tribe or our clan, however you want to define it. But as we began to move into more complex societies and civilizations, and this again is a very philosophic view, not everyone needs to accept it, that we began to need resources which were beyond what we could provide within our own geographic area. 
in these particular needs meant that we were going to be encroaching on different adjacent geographic entities that meant conflict. Now, as the societies moved from early civilizations, you know, 3000 BC, 2000 BC, and so on, those interactions escalated considerably. And as societies became more and more sophisticated and more and more complex, they needed more and more resources beyond what could be provided lo locally. So even if we look at something like the Greek city-states, Athens, Sparta, and so on, back in the hundreds of years before Common Era, BCE, you'll see that many grain imports were required by Greece to feed its people. The same was particularly true of the Roman Empire, and this led to all manner of conflict. So in a sense, <clears throat> unless we're dealing with a very well-confined and relatively basic requirement for a relatively small population that doesn't have much technological sophistication, you can see this kind of dynamic in play. This is no longer the case. And until we realize and accept that, my sense is that we're going to deal with enormous conflicts down the road. Hopefully they won't reach the level of annihilation, but there's always that threat. And as I talked about in the last set of lectures, particularly with the onset of Operation Barbarossa, with the German invasion of Russia, what you begin to see is that this encroachment will reach a level where basically you're looking to annihilate your opponent. Not just win resources, but because of the particular nature of the conflict in World War II, especially among those nations that ended up in conflict as a form of race or ideological war. And I'll deal with that as we go further you're beginning to see something that goes beyond just gathering resources. Now you have to not only take an area, you have to annihilate the inhabitants. And that changes the nature of war entirely. That is part of the difference of World War I and World War II, where World War I did not necessarily seek the annihilation of people other than, for example, uh, the Armenian genocide. But that wasn't in order to take resources so much as it was a matter of getting rid of groups which were deemed inimical to the post nation, in that case, Turkey or the Ottoman Empire. We see that in World War II, and it's not just the annihilation of the Jewish population in Germany and Poland it becomes an annihilation of the Slavic inhabitants of the Ukraine and uh, Western Russia. So we see different approaches. Japan, with its limited ability, being a smaller nation altogether, doesn't seek so much to annihilate the indigenous population, such as when it took over Turkey, I'm sorry, uh, China and Korea, but it certainly subjugated those peoples entirely to the desires and requirements of the Japanese empire. So we're dealing in a way with a very existential crisis when we're dealing with World War II. And it, the result of that existential crisis, it truly becomes a totalitarian war. Everybody, at this particular time is now engaged and everybody, literally everybody becomes a participant, which means both a target and an aggressor. <clears throat> so we have to keep that in mind because the whole dynamic has changed very, very dramatically in World War II compared to what had preceded it. 
even in ancient times, there was less a sense of annihilating the inhabitants than it was of simply securing the resources, perhaps at the expense of the indigenous population. But it was relatively rare, in spite of some of the things we read about today with genocide of the Native Americans and so on and so forth, it was rarely ever the intent to annihilate a population. World War II takes on a different context. Now, the other critical element is that during the period of the uh, early 40s, especially as we're gonna talk about here with the United States, the foresight that was involved and the propaganda, if you wanna call it that, towards the American people to become aware of what was at risk is an enormous step. And it's important for us to keep this in context because it's going to have a great impact on how the United States becomes engaged and how the United States fights World War II, but importantly as a lesson for us even to today. So that's my philosophic and propaganda for the beginning of this lecture. I covered some of this before, but I wanna hit it again because frankly, I don't know how much any of us remember about this kind of stuff. And I think it's important to just flesh out a few details. <clears throat> 1934, 36, 38, and 40. In other words, every two years, the United States took steps to expand its Navy. Why? Because the major threat that was being seen wasn't so much Germany until you hit 1939-40, as it was in dealing with the empire of Japan. Because of Japan's involvement in China in the 30s and the treatment of the native population particularly raised the ire not only of the Roosevelt administration, but it raised the ire of the American people. We as a people, frankly, don't like to see other people simply slaughtered and stand aside and not find that objectionable. It wasn't as though we feared Japan necessarily attacking us, but we were beginning to see movement by Japan and its treatment of it, the indigenous people over whom it ruled through the conquests it uh, achieved, that this was going to become not so much an existential threat to the United States, but certainly a moral and in many ways a political and economic one. When Japan decided it no longer was going to adhere to the ratios established by the London Treaty uh, the 5-5-3 the five, five, ratio, for example, and then walked out of the United Nations as well. Basically, the gauntlet was thrown down to us. How are we going to respond? Were we going to respond? Why would we respond? How would the American people support naval expansion, which clearly at this point was to be directed against Japan? And these were important steps to galvanize the American people. One of the things that we see in this period of time, and I'm going to just bring up a couple of simple points about these expansions, was this. It was incremental almost until war broke out in Europe. And when that happened, it was pretty clear that the United States would have to deal with a dominant Germany on the European continent, as well as a rising powerful Japanese nation in the Far East. And that particular expansion, which had really been somewhat limited though by percentage looked to be a great deal, uh, was dramatically changed by this particular 1940 initiative called the Two Ocean Navy Act. It was also called the Vincent Walsh Act. 
and it called for, and I'm looking at my uh, text here, a 70% increase in naval tonnage allocated at that time, what was an enormous amount of money, $8.55 billion. And it was passed 316 to zero in the House. Now we think about that particular unanimity in view of what was being seen as a extraordinary danger to the United States and how in 1940, we were willing to move ahead with this. It's an extraordinary achievement. And I'm gonna just mention one other thing that goes along with it. We were to build 18 aircraft carriers and 15,000 planes. Now, clearly, given the cost of the uh, most modern American aircraft carrier at $13 billion, uh, and it's now becoming operational for the first time with a full air complement, <clears throat> Uh, the numbers of dollars becomes hard to translate. But the point is that if you look at the GDP at the time and you look at the uh, government budget, this represents a huge chunk of change. So by comparison, it's rather hard, but I think the most recent uh, government budget proposal was something like $7 trillion, uh, which is a number that's just hard to fathom at all. But this wasn't the end of it, <clears throat> not at all. The Neutrality Patrol of 1939 drew a line in the Atlantic at 40 degrees west longitude, except as you approached the South American coast where the line was drawn further east at 20 degrees. And the reason has to do with the geography of the area. This neutrality patrol basically said that if any of the European belligerents sh warships showed up in the Western part, that is to the west of the line drawn, that it would become known generally. Well, of course, this had a major effect on Germany rather than on Britain, even though British warships might be present in an area due to the connection with uh, Canada. We weren't necessarily going to publish it as prominently and let uh, Germany know where these British ships were. So we use this as a subterfuge, if you will to try to impact Germany's approach and aggressiveness, at the same time bolster without being too much in front of the population to support Britain. Now, the next step in destroyers for basis also was taking place well before the United States became engaged. And in this particular situation, we decided, uh, and I use the word we, the Roosevelt administration decided that because Britain lacked enough escorts for its convoys and was beginning to experience losses in its convoys, which we'll come to in a little bit, it was important for the United States also to have bases in the Western Atlantic along the coast like Bermuda, but also in the Caribbean because of trade issues and things of that nature. That we would trade, in other words, lease bases from England and in exchange would give them destroyers. And we had approximately 50 that we had in mothballs and had been constructed late in World War I or soon after World War I. They were sometimes called four stackers because of the number of stacks they had leading out of the engine compartments. This represented a very distinct 
message to Germany that we were willing to arm the British. We had a trade. Now the Germans didn't have anything in the Western hemisphere they could really trade with us, but that's neither here nor there. We wouldn't have accepted it anyway. Now with the fall of France, <clears throat> there were French territories <clears throat> in the Caribbean. So what did the United States do in order to get around the possibility that Vichy France might have to turn over its territories in the Caribbean. Well, we drew together a group of nations and said, if any non-Western hemisphere nation, <clears throat> non-American was the way we phrased it, tried to turn over territories that held in the Western hemisphere to another non-American nation, that that would be prohibited. The territory would be taken over immediately and it would be administered only by the American based, and that doesn't mean United States, it could be South American, Latin American, as we called it at the time. Uh, it could be managed by the, any of those nations. Well, clearly that meant we were telling Germany, you're not going to be able to establish bases in the Western Hemisphere. So again, we took a particular step couched in certain legalese that would not necessarily be a direct challenge to Germany, but it would be a sufficient indication. You're not gonna get what you want here. Now the US-Canada Mutual Defense Pact also in 1940 meant that the United States could use ports in maritime Canada as a base from which we could extend our patrols to get to that western longitude 40 degrees west. Again, a slap in the face at Germany, but at the same time couched in such a way that Germany really wasn't willing to challenge us on that. The Selective Service Act, also in 1940. And just look at all of these different things that happened in 1940 within a relatively short period of time, therefore. And during an election year, all right, you have a situation arising where we're now going to put in conscription, something which had never been done in peacetime in the United States before. Now, in order to get this to pass, one thing that Roosevelt did was bring into his cabinet two uh, Republicans, Frank Knox, who was appointed Secretary of the Navy, and Henry Stimson, who became Secretary of War. Uh, Knox's deputy was James Forrestal, who later became Secretary of the Navy and whose name was attached to a modern uh, aircraft carrier of our particular time, though it's now def defunct. Now, stepping into 1940, another thing that happened was staff conventions between the British and the Americans. I'll come to that in a minute. But the Lend-Lease Act, in which the Roosevelt administration said, we will loan if you will, or hand over certain implements that uh, Britain needs <clears throat> as long as they're returned. And if they're not returned, then you pay for it. It's a, and to use Roosevelt's example, he said, if your neighbor's house is burning down, you hand them a hose, you don't make them buy it from you. You just say, use the hose, help put out the fire, when the fire is done, return the hose, or if it's destroyed in the process, then simply pay us for it at that time. So this was the Lend-Lease Act, and this happened in March of 1941. So again, you can see that there were things happening which got the United States geared up and involved very dramatically under great legal cover before we actually became involved in the fighting. <clears throat>
Now, what else happened? Well, as you see here, we have the staff conversations and these are particularly important as well. Why? Well, between August of 1940 and March of 1941, there were a number of high level engagements that took place based on the initiatives that resulted from the meeting of Churchill and Roosevelt in Argentia, Newfoundland in August 9 to 12, 1941. This particular set of conferences, which had even started, as I said, back in 1940, uh, were important because it began to consolidate the military thinking and the strategic goals that were going to be vital in how the war was to be fought as we became dramatically involved after December 7 and December 11 of 41. The stage was being set for how different levels of resources would be allocated and who would be in charge of what. Now, Churchill was not technically, as is true in the United States, the commander in chief of the armed forces, but as prime minister, he basically was. In the United States, it has a very different issue when you talk about commander in chief, because he truly is the commander of the armed forces and his political role as president is in a sense separate. So when dealing with the different dynamics that are involved in how governments function and the kind of responsibilities that one executive branch in, in the United States has towards Congress and so on, there's a similarity between the prime minister and parliament, but they are still very different. <clears throat> Roosevelt was willing to use both his authority as president and as commander in chief to set these conferences up and allow for the kind of communications that would drive strategy later on. ABC is America, Britain, Canada conference. This was set up in order to establish certain guidelines. Now, importantly, <clears throat> these major conferences I've alluded to already, but I want to go into a little more detail here because these conferences set the stage for what the United States in particular is going to do and then in its alliance with Britain, once war breaks out, then establishes our relationships with Russia as well, and the conduct with the war in the Pacific as it relates to Australia in particular, and so on. So the Atlantic Conference I've already talked about, but I also want to point out an important uh, note that arose out of this. Now note the date. We're not in the war, but we've established in cooperation with Britain something called the Atlantic Charter. Now this has eight particular sections. I'll cover them very quickly, but it, think of the similarity of Wilson's 14 points. The idea here is that we're already setting an agenda for the post-war stage. It's a very interesting and far-sighted way of defining what the ultimate goals are of this conflict, but even before we're in it. <clears throat> First was that the United States and Britain agreed to not seek any territorial gains. Now that's an interesting concept when it's pre-war for the United States. We're not seeking territory. Okay, on what authority can we even make that statement when we're not dramatically involved in the war? It already is a message that says we're gonna be in it we're going to be fighting, our people are going to be in places where they might 
control territory, but we're not going to keep it. It'll revert back. And that follows where the second principle was that oppose any territorial changes against the wishes of the people. Now think of that in relationship right now to Ukraine. You may also have been hearing about Moldova uh, and you might reflect back on 2014, the Crimea and other places where indigenous populations of one particular ethnic orientation have not had the opportunity to join with whatever political entity they wish. Gets to be very, very complex and very difficult. And you may remember from our lectures in World War I and the end of World War I, how confusing and difficult this got and how there were a lot of, I'll call them mini civil wars that occurred as a result of poorly defined political boundaries. If you want an ongoing example right now, think of Israel and Palestine. <clears throat> now, the third principle was restoration of self-government to those nations which had lost it and that people have a right to choose their own form of government. Sounds very good, except we never really let that happen, right? Indeed, the ideological conflict that was a central feature of this particular war as it applied especially to Europe, and that means from Portugal to the Ural Mountains, <clears throat> is how there was not an allowance, indeed there was great conflict over what forms of government would be established when the war concluded. So very nice, except in a way it turned out to be impractical. The fourth and fifth sections dealt with access to raw material, easing of trade restrictions, economic prosperity. Again, all very nice, all very, you know, uh, congenial to our normal way of thinking until you start delving into details. What does it mean to ensure economic prosperity? Where, whose, to what degree is one nation to give up something to another nation for its prosperity? And that gets into the weeds, which we're dealing with every single day of every year not just in World War II. And it bears a lot of what I said in the very beginning about how these six wolf packs didn't engage with each other except very limited on the border. That's no longer the reality of the world. <clears throat> but it's going to have great implications, not only into how the war is fought, but how the peace is fought. And we need to keep that in mind. That's why I bring this up. Freedom of the seas. Well, most of us right now will recognize that that's under enormous threat, depending upon which side you like to look at. Uh, I've emphasized in these previous lectures about China's um, aggressiveness in the South China Sea and its first and second island chain and how this is to diminish the freedom of the seas according to international law. So these are elements which the United States and Britain generally have always mentioned, uh, but freedom of the seas is something that's in contest right now. And eighth, again, one of these great things, countries will abandon the use of force. Again, very nice, but. <laughs> When have we seen that happen? Uh, the answer is never. So Stalin had been invited to join, but obviously in 1941, as you get into the latter part of 41 and look at these particular dates, you may recall from the last lectures that at this particular time, Moscow was directly threatened with 
catastrophe, and I mean the city of Moscow, not just Russia. <clears throat> and I use the word Russia to, as an abbreviation for the Soviet Union throughout all these lectures. The Russian losses with Germany literally approaching the front door <clears throat> were enormous and it was hardly possible for Stalin to leave his country and come for a particular conference. Instead, Churchill went to Moscow in order to flesh out with him what was going on and Roosevelt sent uh, Averill Harriman, uh, I think Stalin, or sorry, Churchill sent Lord, Lord Beaverbrook. And what they agreed to was a support for Russian assistance, a little bit like the Lend-Lease. Remember, this is before the United States is involved. What are we going to agree to? Britain and the United States agreed to send the Soviet Union 400 aircraft, 500 tanks, 10,000 trucks a month in addition to other supplies. Now think of that, that's 6,000 tanks a year, it's 5,000 aircraft, and it's 120,000 trucks a year. Now, just think of the logistics of just getting it there, much less the productivity that has to go on. And then think of what this means to your economy in the United States, because that's where the production is going to have to occur. Britain has been losing aircraft in the so-called blitz, and then is trying to create an air offensive against Germany through strategic bombing. <clears throat> And their need for resources is enormous. Plus, Britain is fighting in North Africa and needs support there beyond what they can produce themselves. So this is all gonna come primarily from us. And then you have to think about how is it going to get to Russia in the first place? And we'll talk a little bit about that, but it's not just through convoys in the Atlantic. The first Washington conference that you see here is after uh, the war has been declared against the United States. And in this, what it really did was reaffirm that we were going to fight Germany to defeat her first, that we would create what we call a strategic defense. Didn't mean we weren't going to do some real fighting, but a strategic defense in the Pacific. The second Washington conference, which developed later in 42, <coughs> excuse me, was to determine the issue of a so-called second front. At this particular time of 1942, and we'll get into it in later lectures in this series, the basic problem facing Stalin and Russia was, they're fighting, as far as they're concerned, this war alone. The only other active front is North Africa. And that truly, by comparison, is a pittance of activity. So Stalin, naturally, with a knife at his throat, <clears throat> is saying to Britain and the United States, you got to get this guy uh, distracted. He's, he's can't put all his effort into trying to kill us. You have to do something. And that means a second front that will divert many resources of Germany to fighting the allies. <clears throat> Logistically, however, despite the desire of the United States to create a second front in 1943 in Europe, it's just not possible. So no amount of wishful thinking is gonna be able to get the United States involved on the continent of Europe in 1943. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the British were successful in convincing us of that. Uh, but as people like to say, the Germans had something to do with it as well as I'll come to shortly. 
The second Moscow conference in August of 17, <clears throat> sorry, August of 42, uh, meant that we had to explain to Stalin, much as he was not gonna be happy about it, uh, that it wasn't going to happen in Europe, it was going to happen in North Africa. <clears throat> now, this is just a picture of some of the staff conferences that were taking place. Uh, if I remember correctly, one of the people attending our lectures uh, has a, had a relative who was involved in some of this. Now, what about the Battle of the Atlantic itself? Because that's partly what the lead slide was after this being World War II. What was the basic issue? Well, as the battle unfolded in the Atlantic in 1939, actually surprisingly little happened in terms of attacks against the merchant fleet. The biggest issues involved there were primarily surface battles that took place outside the River Platte, for example, or the forays of uh, the Bismarck and so on into the Atlantic Ocean to try to disrupt trade. But basically, the actual battle didn't develop in any special uh, danger to Britain until the collapse of France in June of 1940. After that, the German submarine force could now be based on the coast of France rather than have to traverse the Channel or the North Sea to get out to the Atlantic. The Germans also started with this Type 7 German submarine that you'll see. Now, one of the reasons for showing this slide is simply this, compare the size of this submarine to current submarines. Even diesel submarines are much, much larger than this one. <clears throat> Yet, considering war in the Atlantic, these submarines in sufficient numbers nearly brought Britain to her knees. Now, why do I even bother to mention this? Because while the German submarine fleet did improve through the years of the war, the primary workhorse of submarine warfare was this particular submarine. <clears throat> Certainly not impressive to look at, but when you consider the damage it did, it's really pretty remarkable. Submarine fleets these days are nowhere near this number. <clears throat> the Type 9 was a bigger uh, submarine. It had more capacity. It had a bigger deck gun. The numbers weren't as great as they were for the Type 7. But this plus the uh, 7 were the ones that contributed most to the destruction of the merchant fleet. I showed this because although the numbers over here total built will seem to be different from the numbers that are seen on the preceding slides for those of you who are capturing that information, it has to do with commissions that was actually some were built, weren't ready to be put out to sea and so on and so forth. Some of these with very long ranges were actually used to send resources to Japan. So they had less impact on actual fighting. Others were used as supply submarines. They would meet up, they were called milch cows. They would meet up in the Atlantic with submarines that had expended their torpedoes or were running out of fuel or food, would supply them. Then the milch cow would return back to base avoiding any allied ships while the crew of the submarine that was refurbished, re replenished could continue to fight. But even then, time on one of those tiny submarines for more than a couple of months could be emotionally draining. 
Additionally, the power of the torpedo was quite impressive. And the important part here to recognize is that oftentimes the amount of damage, and we'll see this in the Pacific conflict, that a warship could take before it went down uh, was considerably greater than a transport. Even so, transports occasionally could survive a torpedo hit. They weren't necessarily gone with that but it would create an opportunity with a damaged ship to have to leave the convoy or the convoy would have to slow down and remain a target for a much greater period of time. So when you had a damaged transport, even if it wasn't sunk, the submarine could now find it and instead of using a torpedo on it, might surface and use its deck gun to put it down. <clears throat> What we see here are the various areas of operation that took place in the major portions of the Battle of the Atlantic, and that's between uh, really 1939 and 1943, after which much of the German uh, submarine fleet was under great pressure and reduced the numbers of areas in which they could operate with some relative degree of safety. But the purpose to showing this slide is that there were gaps in coverage from the Allied side. And for example, this huge central portion of the Atlantic was not covered at all by aircraft. It was only later in the war that Allied aircraft could cover the entirety of the gap between North America and England. And of course, it was necessary to try to route the ships through areas where those gaps were relatively small so that at least the exposure without knowing where the submarines were uh, was limited. On the other hand, the Germans knew a great deal about the capacity for coverage from air bases and adjusted their locations of their submarines accordingly. So they would try very hard when the gap was very large to concentrate where the major routes for convoys were thought to exist. And as that area was covered more and more by aircraft, then they would shift to these more narrowed segments and try to pick off merchants there. I also bring this slide because I want to show the routes that were used to try to get supplies to Russia, <clears throat> at least in terms of the Atlantic. And the importance of the supply routes coming around Africa when the Mediterranean was nearly cut off from a supply route, but the importance of having a supply route through the Mediterranean once the British basically could control the Mediterranean theater. <clears throat> when the United States entered the war, despite the preparations that you saw and I discussed earlier, what you'll notice is that in 1942, German submarines moved to the American coasts and the Caribbean area. And as you'll see from some of the slides I'll show you, they were so successful, they called it the second happy time because it meant targets were plentiful and they could accomplish a great deal by being there. <clears throat> a little bit in the weeds, but I want you to just reflect mostly on what you're seeing in this slide up here. So Germany initiates warfare. This is September 339 to April 9 of 40. They don't have a great many submarines available at this stage, but you can see the number of ships that are sunk in the proximity to England are really considerable. I mean, think about this in terms of today. If we were to learn, and of course there's this difference that one of our oil tankers 50,000 tons, 100,000 tons for some of the great big ones is sunk. Think of what that meant. 
uh, what that would mean to us today. Well, think of adding up a whole bunch of these ships as being comparable to that. You get an idea of what it means to a nation when it can't get its energy supplies or food or the other resources that it needs in order to sustain itself in this kind of conflict. So this just gives you a dramatic view of the location in which the submarines function. This slide gives you more of a sense of the losses. So 1939, right? The total 421,000 tons sunk, monthly average there. 1940, you go from 421,000 to over 2 million tons. Now think of the impact. This is gross tonnage, right? Not what they were carrying. This has to do with the weight of the ship. So think of, in addition to this, the thousands of tons of contents that are lost and what this means in terms of sustaining a nation. As we go from April of 40 to March of 41, you begin to see the expansion that the Germans were able to cover. And this is partly due to the introduction of the Type 9 submarine that I showed you earlier. They can range further afield, they can be out there longer, and they can begin to intercept those trade routes that I showed you on an earlier slide coming up the west coast of Africa, the expansion all around England. So they're almost closing off the Iceland and Greenland gap. <clears throat> and this is areas that are not covered well by aircraft, though, of course, close to England, aircraft are there. But they're beginning to shift away. The shipping losses further begin to move, as you see, within just a period of nine months. Notice how the scattered effect has shifted even further. And this is the 40 degree line. And then over here with our um, neutrality uh, coverage, the other line is here at 20 degrees. So 40, 20. Notice how the Germans aren't trying to press beyond that at this particular time. But once we hit December 6, things will begin to change. 41, about 2 million tons lost, similar to what was lost in 1940. But this cumulative loss of over four, now getting to four and a half, nearly 5 million tons totally sunk in the beginning, from the beginning of the war to now, puts an enormous strain on shipbuilding, as well as on the deficiencies that England is facing in getting supplies. <clears throat> as we move from December 7th into the middle of 42, you now see this dramatic change. Very impressive change. And this is the so-called happy time. Now, how was it that with all of the steps that Roosevelt's administration had taken, the Navy Expansion Acts and so on, that we appeared to be so unprepared that we see this kind of change that creates an enormous crisis? That has to do with a lot with just how industry can gear up and recognizing what your particular needs are at that time. So here we are now brought into the war. We're going to be actively engaged. For many American people, our attention is diverted to the Pacific, but the administration rightfully understands that if we cannot constrain the losses here, and if Britain goes under, Germany will occupy and control all of Europe. So we have to respond to this. <clears throat> Ship losses 
Look at the year total. Remember that if we add up from 39 to 41, all through that, and we come to here, we're talking 10 million tons of shipping, all sunk, gone. Extraordinary losses. And how is this ever going to be made up? Well, people talk about how important the convoy system was and sometimes give you the impression that the allies didn't understand the importance of a convoy system. No, that's baloney. We understood it. The problems were that convoys could only go as fast as the, small, the uh, slowest ship. And if you were gonna protect the convoy, you had to have a large number of escorts. So here are the merchant ships in between, and then you have various escort ships running a ring around them, trying to suppress or at least identify any submarines. Now you have sonar, but it's somewhat primitive, and the Germans had captured equipment which allowed them to find the weaknesses in sonar and exploit it at least to the best advantage they could muster. So all of this was known and had been practiced in World War I, but because of the slowness of the transports, there were certainly good reasons for many people to say, if I have a transport that can go 17 knots and I have one that goes 12 knots, the guy going 17 knots is gonna get at his destination faster and he might be able to stay away from any submarines that really can only run that fast on the surface to chase them. But if you're only going 12 knots, a German submarine on the surface can catch you and keep up with you and sink you. And so if you conglomerate all of these guys without sufficient protection, you've just created a target rich environment. Now, I showed this because this has to do in part with the effect of the wolf, wolf pack when you don't have sufficient air to help divert where the convoy should go. And in spite of Enigma and Ultra and other things which we had of intelligence on German activity, it became very difficult to avoid some of the tragedies that were uh, going to be inflicted on the merchant marine. And you see it as an example here, right? Date uh, October 40, ships in convoy, including escort 79, 32, almost half of them go down. PQ-17, which I'm going to show you a little bit later, 11 U-boats participating. It says ship sunk 16. That's actually wrong. It was more like 24. So this was so bad. Out of, and there were, this includes escorts. There were 35 merchant ships. 24 were sunk. Churchill was so upset that he suspended convoys to, to Russia. Uh, for a period of time. So just get a sense. These are individual convoys that are hit. Okay. And notice how the Germans were able to muster a large number of submarines into an attack on a convoy. This was called the Wolf Pack system. Now, PQ 17, some of you may have heard about. This was a convoy that was coming from Britain and was to uh, send supplies to Russia. And it had to go through the reaches of, Nor of Norway, which remember was occupied by the Germans and had to contend with the ice pack that would force them in depending upon the time of year. So July, not too bad, but when you get into the later months of the year, the, the ice pack is gonna force this down even to a narrower segment. 
Fortunately for many of the convoys, the weather up here was notoriously bad, overcast, rough seas, and so on. But in this particular situation, July 42, the convoy is detected by German aircraft. They begin to attack. A German surface fleet comes out, and there are submarines in the area. How does this impact things? When you're under attack by surface units, the convoy is supposed to scatter because that spreads the, the flock out, if you will. And it makes it harder for the surface ships to take down a number of transports relatively easily. Aircraft, well, your defense might be better if you're consolidated into a convoy where you can put up more anti-aircraft fire and maybe protect yourselves a little bit more. Submarines, similarly. In this case, there were some terrible communication problems that occurred and the British escorts actually abandoned the convoy and scattered it. And unfortunately that led to a disaster. Now, shore-based aircraft, this again, don't worry, you're not gonna be tested on it. It's just to show a sort of comparison of what the technology really meant and how the technology influenced how the war was going to be fought and in particular, how this also affected protection of convoys. For example, when finally you could get long range aircraft flying out of England, flying out of, <coughs> excuse me, Newfoundland, Iceland, bases in Greenland and so on, you could begin to cover those gaps. It wasn't so much that you needed a big bomb load, uh, but what you needed was something you could drop onto submarines if you could catch them close to the surface. And that could either be depth charges, which were sometimes, or just frankly bombs, or if you were close enough and had escort carriers with the convoy, you could even strafe them. And hopefully that would, would help drive them down, if not sink them. As a result, over time, and this is why I show this slide, even though uh, the Battle of the Atlantic did not conclude until the end of the war, but what it shows is how submarines went from losing very few to losing a great many. And among the various sea services in the German Navy, being in a U-boat was not uh, something that promoted your survival to the end of the war. And you begin to see how in 43, and even in 42, as we approach towards the end of 42, how, much success we now were having against the German submarine threat. So one of the first victories that we began to experience as the allies fighting in World War II was this. But there was another triumph which was to occur and we're almost to the end of this section and then we'll take a break. American industry, <clears throat> even in 1940, began to put together a program, and you've probably heard the name Liberty Ship. Uh, it's an extraordinary undertaking. And when we look at the losses that I showed on an earlier slide, Britain lost 3.8 million tons, the US 2 million, with one month alone, 700,000. Yet, American shipbuilding primarily, the British as well, produced nearly 5 million tons, not quite enough to offset these losses. And we were on the negative curve for a good while, and that was an enormous threat to the conduct of the war. But what I want to show you is this, <coughs> U.S. merchant fleet grew from 8.7 to 41 million 
greater than all nations combined. The extraordinary achievement and the number involved here are interesting in comparison to where we are now as the United States. <clears throat> we have nowhere near the shipbuilding capacity nor the size of a merchant fleet that anywhere approaches this. Most of our merchant fleet is either mothballed because we don't have crews to run it, or it's too expensive. So we have what we call reflagging, where ships are registered with a different nation <clears throat> rather than with the United States. As a result of that, requirements for various safety features and equipment and things of that sort are limited. And it means it's cheaper to run the ship and to achieve a profit than was the case if you were an American flagged ship. You may also in recent times have heard about the Jones Act where certain goods had to be carried by American ships and things of that nature. These are small points that might escape your notice as being very important. But actually, when you get down again in the weeds, and if <clears throat> situations facing us today are very possibly going to take us into a armed conflict, boots on the ground kind of thing, I'm not referring to Ukraine, I'm talking about something different then our lack of shipbuilding capacity is something that may be very difficult to overcome. But at least in 1940, and then by war's end, the United States had achieved something truly remarkable. <clears throat> I show this because you'll see here day two, day three, day six, 250,000 parts, modules might weigh 100 tons. We didn't have the shipyards and we didn't have the facilities at the shipyards that could put together a ship in a modular fashion. But within a short period of time, we were able to do that. And it truly was extraordinary. So look at the days. This is day two, day three, day six, day 10. You'll see another set of photographs in a minute. But I also want you to notice this. A workforce with 18% women in shipbuilding and vast numbers of African-Americans. Remember how terribly segregated the United States was at the time. The armed forces were segregated at the time largely due to Woodrow Wilson, uh, because prior to Woodrow Wilson, there had been much higher levels of integration, but this was not the case in 1940-41. What this shows you is again, just with, within this short period of time, day 10, day 14, day 21. Notice here, <clears throat> highest proportion of any service in terms of killed. Now, compared to other nations and their losses, the United States got off easy. But the important part to remember is that there was still an enormous sacrifice on the part of Americans who joined into this conflict. And the achievement that occurred in building Liberty ships, aside from all the others that were going to be built, all the warships, all the carriers, all the transports that were gonna be used in the Pacific and to conduct the various invasions of North Africa, Sicily, Southern France, and ultimately Normandy, the invasion of Okinawa and so on. It's just unfathomable <clears throat> that we were able to do this. But I want to also point out one other thing. It wasn't until 1986 Merchant Marines were permitted to obtain the GI Bill and other veterans' benefits. <clears throat> 
I have no idea why that was the case, <clears throat> but that's the way it was. So let's take a break and I will answer questions. I see that there are at least three on chat. And if anyone needs a, uh, oh, okay. That's more to Tom than to anything else. If anyone has any questions, comments, <clears throat> criticisms, different viewpoints, just weigh in. Let's, let's have fun doing all this. Dory, I see, uh, yes. I see your hand is up. My question, it is indeed extraordinary that the US was able to ramp up and churn out so much material. Did the factories run 24 seven? Eventually, <clears throat> many did, particularly armaments and shipyards. But again, there's a certain level at which resources had to be allocated. So some factories, particularly towards consumer goods, uh, the availability of tires and things of that sort uh, were very limited. Thank you. You bet. I have a question. I have a statement, I guess. Sure. Go ahead, Mary Jo. Um, my father was in a convoy going to Europe. And back when I was younger, I watched, there was a documentary led by Sir Lawrence Olivier. I think it was The World at War. And I happened to be at their house. And I said to him, weren't you frightened going over across the North Atlantic in November in a convoy? And he, being an eight, he said, no, I was 18 years old. I actually, if I went up, we would look for them and it would be much more fun than being in the middle. He says, I liked being on the outside ship. <laughs> so that was his reaction to it as a comical aside. That was the way he looked at it. Right. I hear you. And in, indeed, there's another thing which you've just hinted at, uh, perhaps unintentionally. Mm. But when we talk about people preparing for the last war or the war, you know, is fought by the gray haired gentlemen who've never seen conflict or sitting comfortably in their smoking chairs and eating caviar. Uh, it takes an enormous sort of frame of mind as well as an enormous amount of physical energy mm. to, to be even a merchant marine. I mean, you think of how rough the North Atlantic could be and then how bitterly cold. There are pictures of ice caking the superstructures of ships and quite literally threatening because they made them top heavy of them turning over. So young men, had to get out there in the bitter cold and chop away ice, climbing up onto you know, various poles and posts and knocking it away so their ship wouldn't sink. Yeah. I, I find it hard to imagine being able to do that in a rough sea. I mean, I get seasick on a lake. Uh, <laughs> he was sick. He said he was uh, sick all the time. Uh, he said he could never eat lamb after that because. I hear you. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> Anymore. We never had lamb in our house because he just couldn't stand it. <laughs> oh my goodness. <clears throat> well, anyway. It's... It's, it's an important thing for us to remember. And there are comments that you know I'll be making as I go. I, one of the things I ran across just recently, again, these different articles that I find, our current armed services have indicated that 70% of the individuals whom they would consider of the proper age to join the military cannot join because of a number of problems. Obesity, criminal records, low intelligence, and illnesses. 
And to me, if anything underscores what kind of changes have occurred in our culture, uh, to me, it's just amazing. I, uh, yeah. I think back to the Civil War time where they, they all you needed to have were two front teeth. <laughs> <laughs> so you could bite off the cartridge, you know, and the rest of it. And of course, <laughs> we we can have excuses for all of this. And it's not a blame either. You know, everybody yeah. thinks the, the current generation's a disaster. But when you have numbers like that thrown in front of you by the military and what they're talking about, what they've done in situations is lower the physical standards. Then you think to yourself, well, how's that going to play out in reality? Well, people say, listen, I can sit behind a desk and I can run a drone from, you know, the comfort of my home, if you will, and drop a bomb on somebody in Afghanistan. And I don't need to be fit to do that. And you think, OK, up to a point, I can kind of understand that. But going along with physical fitness is a form of mental fitness. and there's something lacking when you're in that situation. Now, for those of us who've just gotten older, we can appreciate that, yeah, we've gotten a bit lazier, we got more aches and pains, we're just not you know, gonna do certain things. But here's another example, and then I'll get back to our lectures in a bit after we have people back from their bathroom breaks. Uh, in New York, <clears throat> And I think this was for the NYPD, but I, I, I could be wrong. It, it could be a different uh, police district somewhere else. Is they got rid of the requirement to run a mile and a half in, I think it was almost 15 minutes. So if you think that's a 10 minute mile which is not a lot to ask of a 20 year old. Right, right. They got, they got rid of it because the, they found people couldn't do it. That was one thing. But the second part was, and this was a comment by the police chief, none of our officers chase a suspect for a mile and a half. <laughs> and you think to yourself, <laughs> that isn't the point. <laughs> the point is conditioning. The point is being physically fit. So even if you have to run a hundred yards and you get them, you're more physically fit if you've been able, had to run further, you got more energy by the time you get on top of the guy and you know put him down. Uh, it's just striking to me how- I guess you have to leap over a chain link fence too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Doc. Yes. yes. Um, 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 who's going to go? Who's going to go? Raise hand. hand. You'll have your hand raised. Yeah, but I'm yeah. not yeah. going to What's happening to the. Okay, Bob. Okay, Bob. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Please. Please. Whoa. Whoa. Bob, Bob, Bob uh, Pompey has a stand up. Michael? Yeah. Go ahead, Bob. Hold on a minute. Where's the sound? What's it, what's it uh, doing out there, by the oh, way? Oh, Pompey. So, Where's the sound? I don't know. I have no idea what it is anymore. Uh, hmm. uh, okay. It was here, but it's. Okay, can I ask my question now? Go to it. Go to it. Go to it. Okay, my question is this were, were there any American flag ships involved in the conflict before we actually entered the war? or before uh, Lend-Lease became a uh, dominant uh, uh, policy? Uh, Henry, 
The yeah. middle part of your question was garbled. Yeah. Let me try it this way. Is that better? All right. Were there any American flag ships or American ships involved in the uh, convoys that shipped goods to Europe before we got involved, before 1941? The answer is yes, <clears throat> uh, but it was not in a formal escort. It was more a matter that we would say, well, we're just patrolling. And there uh -huh. happens to be a convoy somewhere nearby. And if it had been to the west of the 40 west longitude line, then we would be sure to alert the convoy and say, gee, you know, there's somewhere over here a German submarine. Maybe you guys should know that. <laughs> OK. Now well, that, that I led. Mean, I didn't mean the escorts. I was thinking more of the the merchant ships themselves. So that if we lost a a merchant ship that, uh, over the forty degree line or anywhere along the line, uh, or, or you know either side of the line, uh, wouldn't that be uh, cause us belly? It would, in a sense. Except, I let me rephrase my answer. I know of no specific incident. I know that the Reuben James, or I think there were some other American ships that were fired upon by the Germans, but I don't know of any merchant ships because the basis of Lend-Lease was you have to come and get it and then you can take it back, but yeah, not American flagships. Money to be made by the by the owners of the ships to uh, get involved in that, I would think, and well, uh, that would drive up your insurance rates considerably. Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> and the Germans did indicate, as they had in World War One, that if you entered certain places around England, then you were in violation of some particular law. They were. Uh, basing their actions on and said you could become a target. It wasn't unrestricted warfare the way it was defined in World War One, where they said, we can take down anybody anytime. But they were walking as we were a very fine line to try to prevent from the German standpoint, pushing the United States into war but one of the reasons offered by Hitler in December 11th uh, was that the United States is already in it. You know, there's nothing different. Now we're just going to remove the legal barriers and we'll sink whomever we wish. Yeah. If he hadn't done that, then it would have been a causes belly, just as you were saying. Do you want to okay. your questions? Sure. Karen? Yeah, uh, Bob's got a question. Ask away. Michael, maybe they don't have to chase them from uh, a mile and a half, but sometimes you have to go up five flights of stairs. You got it. So you conditioning is just not on the flat. It just makes you understand, as you already do, Bob, that some of the excuses that were offered by people who are in positions of authority just don't make sense. And you kind of wonder, I can't help but ask myself, do you think I'm that much of an idiot? I, I just, it's insulting. If you say we don't need it because they're physically fit after a mile that they do in 15 minutes. Well, I could challenge that, but don't pretend that because they're not going to chase somebody a mile and a half, you know, that's the issue. You hit it right on the head. You go up five flights of stairs. Right. They shoot them first. Okay. People, um, I know it's getting on, and I'm sorry for uh, mm -hmm. drag, appearing to drag this out, but I think as I at least try to justify what I do, my intent is to 
not just explore some of the nuances that are going on, some of the achievements, some of the mistakes that occur during this conflict, but to bring home to us that <clears throat> what I'm talking about is not far removed from the kinds of situations we are encountering literally today and the kinds of conversations that are going on, which are of enormous importance and will have a great deal to do with what happens to this nation, what happens globally within the next few years. There was a comment just I saw today where uh, Premier Xi said he wants his military to prepare for war and emphasize not just an issue of training, you know, like we do regularly anyway. The emphasis and it was supported by another one of his major ministers is prepare for war. And that kind of makes my blood run cold a little bit. Okay, <clears throat> I put this up because I think it's an interesting comparison to look at the size of Japan compared to the United States. You'll see that it uh, geographically is not that large. And by comparison, its population was clearly much, much less. Nonetheless, as I talked about in the lectures last time, what the Japanese were able to accomplish within a relatively short period of time was extraordinary. It truly was brilliant. And we had underestimated the capacity of Japan to do what it did Plus, we underestimated its technological advances. Now, we learned how to overcome those in time. It was costly, but we did it. And in a way, we did it much more quickly than one might normally have anticipated or expected from us, but there it is. <clears throat> I show this map because what I want to demonstrate is that while Pearl Harbor was attacked well off the slide to the right, what you're seeing, and particularly look at the legend right up here in miles, the distances involved and the number of different actions that took place over a relatively short period of time when Japan decided it was going to go to war. The planning that went into this before it could happen was enormously complicated and exceptionally well executed. There's hardly a situation that I could look at that is comparable to what the Japanese were able to do here, truly. <clears throat> now, this is a different kind of map from what you saw before. I'll go back up here for a minute. You'll notice that it ends down here at Borneo. <clears throat> the reason I show this, here's Borneo over here, is that the Japanese <clears throat> came very, very close to being able to intercept, to cut off Australia, <clears throat> part of the British Commonwealth, from supply coming from the United States. You would be able to bring those supplies in around Africa or through the Indian Ocean perhaps. But what the Japanese were particularly interested in having at this time was control over the resources here, particularly oil and rice. Turns out Burma, Myanmar, here's Burma up here, was the world's greatest exporter of rice in 1940. I had not known that until I stumbled across the information later. <clears throat> Truly extraordinary. <clears throat> now, one of the things that is noticeable, not readily apparent here, but this is 1942, 
shortly after Pearl Harbor and shortly after the landing in the Philippines and the Malay Peninsula, <clears throat> is that the Japanese had been encroaching all the way through until they controlled the entire coast of China. So no supplies could get in through there. And China, which was sucking up a lot of resources and energy by Japan, nonetheless was very bereft of supplies coming from the West. Uh, think of Ukraine and how dependent it is on Western supplies. China, very similarly. The difference between <laughs> Ukraine and China, China is a whole lot bigger with a lot more people. <clears throat> Nonetheless, the Japanese <clears throat> made great inroads. And in particular, this point down here with the port of Rabol became a critical juncture. And these dashed arrows represent other lines that the Japanese were thinking of taking. As I talked about in the last set of lectures, <clears throat> the Japanese had talked about wanting to establish a perimeter. This line isn't quite accurate enough because eventually they took all of Sumatra and Java and all the way down through here <clears throat> to this area. In order to establish a hard perimeter against which any encroaching Navy, the United States in particular, would suffer catastrophic losses before it could engage the main Japanese fleet. It was a brilliant strategy, and you begin to see it here outlined in this particular slide, as developing a perimeter which would hold back anybody trying to penetrate. So successful were the Japanese at this particular time that <clears throat> the term victory fever has been offered as the explanation for what became Japanese overreach. But I also wanna put it within context of what the Japanese were facing. Now, I'm gonna take a little quick tangent before we go further into this, I'm just gonna get off here for a minute, there we go. <clears throat> and discuss that what I have not talked about is the American Doolittle raid where the Hornet had on it B-25s, which were a land-based air twin engine plane, a light bomber put on an aircraft carrier, flown off an aircraft carrier and struck Tokyo. <clears throat> now, the importance of that is analogous to what happened in Germany when the first strategic air raid by the British struck Germany. And that was that Goering in Germany had basically said, no British aircraft will ever strike Germany proper. And when it happened, a whole lot of resources had to be diverted to protect German airspace. What happened with the Doolittle raid was that it emphasized two things. First, it was land-based air. <clears throat> as far as the Japanese knew, they had no idea that it, these were planes flown off an aircraft carrier. There was no way you could fly a B-25 off an aircraft carrier. <clears throat> so when there was some commentary by the United States, by Roosevelt, about where these aircraft had originated, he used the term Shangri-La. The idea is you have no idea. The Japanese looked at this and said, if they were from Midway or if they were from the Aleutians and they were stuffed with fuel, they might be able to make that one-way trip because they never saw any aircraft turn around and try to fly back. So they one way trip into China, <clears throat> those that could make it. So their thought was if we push our perimeter further, then they won't be able to reach the homeland. Now, another example Hitler's strategy in the Eastern Front. I want to push the Russians back far enough that their bombers cannot attack Germany proper, German industry, or the Romanian oil fields at Loesti. 
I need that protection. So here, Japanese overreach is based on less a sense of victory fever, perhaps, and it's based upon a strategic issue of we need more distance. So that's what you see with this second line. Now, pushing further east from the Pacific, and you notice there's a relative dearth of islands north east, sorry, northwest of Hawaii that can be used as air bases, Midway being the most prominent. And if you look at the geography of Midway, it's really a small island. So if you concrete the whole thing to create an airfield, you still have very limited numbers of aircraft you can base there. But if you have longer range bombers, you might be able to penetrate Japanese airspace and attack the homeland. So taking Midway, that could be useful. What about the Aleutians? Well, the weather up there is a disaster. Even if you had an occasional aircraft based up in the Aleutians that you could use to attack the Japanese homeland, it's gonna be a nuisance. It's not gonna be a real danger. However, if we want, as was this other goal, not just to take Midway, but we want to bring the American carriers that exist in the Pacific into battle on terms favorable to us, then if we attack into the Aleutians at some point, we may draw those carriers out, have them out of position, we take Midway and we base planes on Midway, which gives us an additional aircraft carrier, one that is unsinkable. Fine. What else? Notice the perimeter extends down here. The Solomon Island chain, the New Hebrides, New Caledonia, New Mia, which have bases that are actually pretty sizable and can support a decent sized fleet. Up at Rabol, the main fleet other base other than truck, which is even further west, means that if you can get into this area and control it, then supplies that are coming across the South Pacific can be interdicted and you can prevent strategic bombing from the coast of Australia from going up and hitting oil fields in the Malay region or intercepting transport ships that are crossing into that area as well, south of Borneo and so on. So the push to the south represents a logical support to push back even further. And when you've been so successful as the Japanese were here, it's made a great degree of strategic sense to push further. Now, <clears throat> the first step was to control the area on New Guinea, which was going to allow for a closer coverage of the area that involved the east coast of Australia. And the Solomon Island chain that you're seeing here with that particular Island Guadalcanal being an important initial sideshow. The more important one was this guy over here, Port Moresby, on the southern coast of Papua New Guinea, and also putting a place here at Milne Bay, which isn't shown on this map just yet. But if you can put bases along the north coast and then control Port Moresby and have that, you can interdict much of the east coast of Australia. The initial move down the Solomons was almost an afterthought. Let's get some control down here so we now know what's going on in this part of the Pacific region. And eventually, if we're fortunate, we can push all the way down into the New Hebrides and interdict the uh, Allied forces, the American Navy particularly. <clears throat> so what happens? In May of 1942, 
much of the territory that Japan wanted to control was controlled. They had it pretty much solidly in their hand. There might be a few bands fighting here and there, but by and large, they'd accomplished their main strategic goal. But the attack in April against the homeland stimulated them to go a bit further. And here's the idea, here's Port Moresby, right? Here's the east, northeast coast of Australia, and here's the Solomon Island chain. As was typical for the Japanese, <clears throat> they developed complex plans in order to achieve a particular goal. Now, this sometimes has been challenged as creating too many different groups that have to interact in a very close schedule and it's too easy for it to fall apart. <clears throat> in part, that answer is yes, but in part, the answer has to do with how do you organize an invasion? And remember that the Japanese had already demonstrated that the kind of planning they could do, which allowed them to take over all those areas that I showed <clears throat> in this previous slide here, right? They had reason to be confident with the way they planned. It had been enormously successful. So what was to happen? <clears throat> the idea was that there would be an invasion fleet with a surface group that would help cover it and protect it and bombard. And they would sail around the tip of Papua New Guinea. They would put some troops perhaps at Milne Bay, which is right there at that tip. But more importantly, they would capture Port Moresby. <clears throat> and by taking Port Moresby, their air coverage could extend all through that area, sorry, could extend like this. In addition, they planned to put just a seaplane base initially at Tulagi, which was across the Sealark Channel from Guadalcanal. <clears throat> They would take over some of the uh, British holdings there from when the British held the Solomons, and they would set up a seaplane base because their seaplanes could range quite far out. Here's Numea, New Caledonia, New Hebrides, important parts that the US Navy was going to use. And by bringing a strike group down, which was their aircraft carriers, <clears throat> they could come down and the Americans were thought to be sucked into this area of the Coral Sea, and they would be caught here. Because the Japanese would be coming from the east, even though the invasion was going to come from here, the Americans would be brought into this and they could be caught here, and there would be another surface group which could come down and damage or sink the American fleet. <clears throat> so it was not, a, a dumb plan at all. But like most things, the execution ended up being a bit different. And I show this because it shows how complicated the movements are. And I'm going to break this down very quickly. Initially, the American carriers that were going to be present in the Battle of the Coral Sea were formed into different task groups. So when we talk about breaking up your organization into different uh, segments, we were doing that as well. And we had reasons to do it and had practiced it. Nonetheless, we go up <clears throat> and send a carrier up here, which attacks Tulagi and then retreats back to meet up with the other strong carrier force while we try to find the Japanese. The Japanese realize that the Americans are coming, so the invasion fleet is kind of stalled here. They don't want to bring that out where it's vulnerable. And the carriers, the Japanese carriers, are coming around the corner here, unexpected in terms of location for us. As this happens, as this breaks down, the American tanker Neosho and a destroyer. The Sims are caught by the Japanese, and the Sims is sunk, the Neosho is damaged badly and has to uh, 
it floats away for a couple of days before it's finally sunk. <clears throat> but in the process, the American carriers had moved ahead further than where the Japanese main characters were located. And we discovered a light carrier, the Shoho. We attacked that and sank it. But in the process, we were now discovered. <clears throat> and of the two large fleet carriers that were present, the Lexington and the Yorktown, <clears throat> the Japanese launch an attack. They severely damage Lady Lex, as she's called. They modestly damage Yorktown. The Shikaku, a Japanese fleet carrier, is damaged and has to retreat. <clears throat> when this happens, we would consider this a sort of trade, except we lost a major fleet carrier compared to a light carrier, and we had the Yorktown damaged and the Shokaku damaged. It looked like not quite an uneven trade, but pretty close. More importantly, because the Japanese were still not aware of how many American carriers were in the region, they decided that they would not bring this particular invasion fleet around and attack Port Moresby. The Americans had dispatched some surface ships to try to intercept it if they went that way. But given the power of the Japanese fleet, that probably would not have stopped them had they wished to go ahead, but they would have taken serious losses. So Coral Sea, the first battle that takes place between two fleets without the engagement of surface ships directly, aircraft carrier against aircraft carrier, turns out to be a strategic win for the United States, but tactically a draw or maybe a slight loss. <clears throat> Lexington's gone, Yorktown has to retreat back to Pearl. Now, <clears throat> this slide is just designed to show that in terms of how things set up and what happened in terms of losses and so on, the CV refers to a main fleet character, carrier. It has many more aircraft. It's much more capable of, of fighting over distances, the light carriers much less so. But what it shows is how the Japanese fleet was broken down and how many aircraft are involved. <clears throat> the United States, <clears throat> by comparison, had two fleet carriers, no light uh, carrier, had about the same number of aircraft, okay? And we lost 69 there at the Coral Sea. Now, again, what this slide is designed to show is that as a consequence of the defeat, the strategic defeat of the Coral Sea down here, the Japanese recognized that in order for them to reestablish an invasion of Port Moresby, they really needed to drive the American Navy back or engage it in such a fashion that we could have our main fleet carrier sunk. The Japanese carrier fleet that had struck Pearl Harbor had been spending time back in Southeast Pacific region and had actually gone into the Indian Ocean for a period of time. So those carriers had returned to Japan for refit and rest, while fewer fleets uh, carriers were needed to support the invasion of Port Moresby. That's why there was the similarity in the number of carriers available to both sides. However, with only the Shukaku being damaged, but the Zuikaku, which was the other major carrier there, uh, having to return to Japan because of depleted, depleted air crews, the Japanese could only really muster their four fleet carriers in order to support 
the Midway Strike Force. So as May moved into June, the Japanese decided to move ahead with their attack on Midway. <clears throat> a secondary attack, as I've already alluded to, was to have the Aleutians Force, which would draw the American carriers north and would <clears throat> imbalance how the fighting would occur. The Japanese fleet would have the chance to take Midway first, establish yet another carrier, if you will, and then defeat any American fleet that was now on its way down from the north. What threw this off for the Japanese was something they didn't know. And that was that we had intelligence, which was allowing us to piece together information, which would permit us to understand what the main thrust of the Japanese was going to be. Now, I show this picture <clears throat> because as we will find, aircraft carriers appear in one level to be vulnerable, but in another fashion are incredibly strong and powerful and resistant to damage. When the Yorktown returned to Pearl Harbor after Coral Sea, the initial estimates was it would take several weeks for the ship to be repaired and be combat ready. Nimitz, knowing what was coming towards Midway, said, you've got three days. And indeed, the patch that was done was so remarkable that Yorktown was able to leave Pearl within that three-day period, even though for part of her voyage back to the Western Pacific, she still had repair crews working at it. Some weaknesses could not be corrected in that period of time, and they likely played a role into what happened to Yorktown. But the Japanese had not realized that Yorktown would be present. And this was a surprise for them. As the <clears throat> Americans approached the area of Midway, we had <clears throat> both the um, I'm sorry, excuse me. Just got to get here. Here we go. That we had in theater <clears throat> some carriers. Unfortunately, Saratoga was uh, too far away to be of use. So when the uh, Battle of Midway took place, the American fleet <clears throat> lacked its considerable power that it would have had with yet another fleet carrier. But time was such that there was no opportunity to manage it differently. Similarly, Midway had been developed into a significant enough air base that actually heavy bombers, B-17s, could be based on it. And this was, again, one of those extraordinary achievements that occurred within a relatively short period of time. Uh, an example of the ingenuity and aggressiveness with which excuse me, uh, things would happen. Now, the Japanese mustered four fleet carriers. And within this, they had a substantial impression that they had more aircraft available than did the United States. It turns out that the two sides were actually fairly well balanced in terms of the number of aircraft. So what was the other issue that mattered in the Battle of Midway? The Japanese had an advantage in that their aircraft based on their aircraft carriers had longer range than did the Americans. So like a boxer who has a longer reach, if you can engage your opponent before he can get close enough in to harm you, then you're gonna win. 
your opponent has to get in close, taking whatever blows might be delivered against him as he moves in before he can begin to try to harm you. And by the time he comes in, you may well have weakened him sufficiently to be able to land a knockout blow. We knew this. So how did we try to fix it? Well, this came down to one of the most important decisions related to the Battle of Midway, and that was that we needed an element of surprise. We had to be where the Japanese did not expect us. And as was true with the title of the book, The Miracle of Midway, it did indeed take a bit of a miracle for us to accomplish that. I'll read this very short section though, because I think what it does is reveal something important about the philosophy that governed the American fleet as Nimitz instructed Fletcher and Spruance who were going to be in charge of the operation. In carrying out the task assigned, you will be governed by the principle of calculated risk which you shall interpret to mean the avoidance of exposure of your force to attack by superior enemy forces without good prospect of inflicting as a result of such exposure, greater damage on the enemy. Now, that sounds again, like just sort of nonsense. You know, what does that mean in practicality? How are you really going to judge that? But one of the key elements that ties into the American way of war, as was true for many of the other nations, but with less degrees of flexibility, <clears throat> is that the commander on the spot was given the mission here, inflict damage on the enemy without undue exposure. Spruance and Fletcher have to figure out what that means and how to do it. Now, <clears throat> that's important because all of the planning, the organization of the uh, task forces, how they're going to cooperate with each other and communicate <clears throat> and so on, plays an enormous role in the outcome. Now, what this particular slide shows you is how the two fleet systems came into uh, the fight. Initially, <clears throat> the Midway planes identified the Japanese fleet and launched attacks against it. In this situation, <clears throat> they inflicted very, very little damage. By comparison, the Japanese at a fairly long distance from Midway were able to launch aircraft which pummeled Midway, but being an island, couldn't be sunk. As a result, Nagumo, who was in charge of the main carrier fleet, he had been in charge at Pearl, decided based on the information he had received and the lack of information on identification of any American carriers. Remember, the Aleutian attack was supposed to draw those American carriers north. With not finding anything initially, started to rearm his ships for another attack on Midway. They had suffered no damage from the Midway-based aircraft. But clearly, if you want to bring in an invasion fleet, which was actually coming from this direction, uh, outside the scope of this <clears throat> particular photograph, you need to suppress or eliminate that kind of opposition. They had a sort of recollection <clears throat> of what had happened at Wake Island, a small island you know, defended by a few Marines that shot up transports and actually drove them off the first time because they didn't have sufficient firepower at Wake to suppress the defense. Here, they were gonna make sure they had plenty of firepower. So Nagumo starts to coordinate his carriers to launch another strike. 
he has sent out patrol craft, aircraft, to try to find if there are any American ships in the region. And by pure happenstance, it turns out that the one Japanese plane which did find the American carriers had left its carrier about a half hour late and had run into some communication problems so that the word identifying that there were American carriers in the vicinity was delayed in getting back to Nagumo. Now in this situation, he's beginning to think, what am I gonna do now? He's in the process of rearming for a land attack. <clears throat> that means that he's not loading torpedoes and armor piercing bombs on his main attack craft. He's got <clears throat> different waves of planes that have been flying uh, combat air patrol over the fleet. They've been up there for a while. They're gonna need to be refueled. They don't need to be rearmed because they haven't had to shoot at anybody. <clears throat> and then on top of the whole mess, an American submarine, the Nautilus, actually <laughs> ends up almost in the middle of the Japanese fleet. And it fires off a couple of torpedoes, not getting any hit. But immediately that causes the Japanese aircraft carriers to begin to uh, zigzag and move around in different ways to avoid the possibility of a torpedo strike and to peel off some escorts to find that darn thing and see if they can't sink it. <clears throat> Well, while you're maneuvering to avoid a torpedo attack, you can't land aircraft. It takes moving into the wind at particular speed in order to launch aircraft and somewhat analogous in terms of landing them. So <clears throat> there are several delays that begin to occur. And once that message returns back to Nagumo that American carriers have been sighted, and are within striking distance, then he has a difficult choice to make. Do I send improperly armed aircraft against the American carriers where the damage they'll likely inflict with high explosive bombs, no torpedoes, no armor piercing, is not likely to accomplish very much? Do I send them down to Midway, which no longer seems to represent a great threat because here's the threat, or do I bring these aircraft on deck and start rearming and refueling so they can launch a strike against the carriers? The carriers are the danger. <clears throat> and as that happens, the Americans have managed to launch their own aircraft because they have found the fleet and they're ready for action already. Well, what happened was that the American uh, aircraft initially trying to find the Japanese fleet don't find it. And due to the complexity of launching air operations, they end up launching piecemeal torpedo bombers are going ahead of the dive bombers. They end up going without fighter escort. And when they hit the Japanese fleet, they are crushed. Not a single hit is made. Well, nearly every single one of the aircraft is shot down and most all of them are killed. In the initial attack from the Hornet, <clears throat> Only one man survived, and he was eventually rescued by uh, Catalina. <clears throat> so out of 41 planes launching torpedo attacks, only six returned. Now, because it's 12 o'clock, I'm going to summarize the effects of what happened, and then I'll stick around if people have comments or questions. Japanese 
combat air patrol had come down in order to uh, engage the torpedo planes. The torpedo planes might fly in at 10,000 feet, but they're launching at 200 feet. So the cap, once they see the American torpedo bombers coming in low, are gonna start diving on them and engaging them down here. As that begins to happen, that means the top cover is being lost. And because the ships have to maneuver all over the place to avoid the torpedoes, they don't get to launch the aircraft that are on their deck. They're proceeding as best they can with rearmament. But these, these aircraft carriers are turning very, very fast and they tend to heel over you know, a few degrees to the port or starboard. So things are very unstable, even on the decks themselves, until finally they're able to beat off the American torpedo planes and begin to resume a course, which will allow them to launch their aircraft. But just as that happens, the American dive bombers appear overhead. <clears throat> And quickly separating into different groups, they begin to target the aircraft carriers. And within literally just minutes, just minutes, three of the major four aircraft carriers the Japanese have have been struck catastrophically by dive bombers. With the fuel and munitions exposed on deck, with aircraft on deck, with men exposed on deck who are trying to do all this work, it is an absolute disaster. There's an excellent book called The Shattered Sword that goes into many of the details of what happened to these aircraft carriers and why they went down the way they did. <clears throat> Only one carrier escapes to hear you. And in terms of the hear you, it's able to launch an attack which discovers the Yorktown and puts a number of hits on her. Uh, she's quite badly hurt. It looks as though she's going to sink. And it's thought at the time that from the Japanese standpoint that she indeed was sunk. As it turned out, uh, damage control was so good that the Yorktown was brought back online and underway and looked as though she might survive. A second strike that comes from here you <clears throat> finds the Yorktown, doesn't realize that it's the same ship, and finally puts some lethal hits on it. But in the interim, the Americans have launched against the here you, and they strike it and they sink it. So the ultimate effect is that the Yorktown does go down eventually, but the um, Enterprise and the Hornet remain. Some of the Yorktown air crew that could not land on Yorktown land on the other two carriers. But for all the Japanese aircraft, there's no place to land. So those that are flying around when their carriers are sunk have nothing to do but ditch in the sea and hope they're gonna get picked up. So the ultimate result <clears throat> is catastrophic for the Japanese. Now, I'm going to stop here. Uh, I wanted to try to cover this more thoroughly before, but I get too long-winded and I want to Thank you all again for participating. I appreciate the agony some of you may have suffered <laughs> as a result, but I'll certainly answer any questions you have and I'll stay as long as you like. Uh, Tom, you could probably stop recording right now. You there? Yes, uh, I'm doing it. Okay, and anyone who wants to ask questions, feel free. Uh, John, you have a question? 